Great. We are live on Facebook. Welcome to another New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation. It's a real great privilege today and honor to have the mayor of Vineland, New Jersey, Mr. Anthony Finucci on with me today. Mayor, thank you for joining me. Thank you, JR, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And of course, uh, on the 21st anniversary of Pearl Harbor, um, I was born in Newcomb Hospital, um, uh, so I have a great affinity and a love for my hometown, and I certainly uh, am honored to have uh, my hometown's mayor on with me today uh, with Mayor Anthony Finucci. And Mayor, give us a little bit of a bio about yourself, and uh, then we'll get, dis we'll, we'll, we'll get uh, in discussion on all the great work you're doing in Vineland. Thanks, JR. Uh, essentially, you know, I'm just me, but uh, I, I fill a few roles in life. I'm a proud father and husband, uh, small business owner. Um, I was a previous school board member um, and elected first in uh, April of 2006, consecutively reelected again in 2009, and then uh, moved forward um, in the uh, general elections of 2012 to become a councilman. Um, which I took office in January of 13, uh, became council president here in the city of Ireland and moved forward <clears throat> subsequently thereafter in the uh, 16 elections to become uh, mayor, uh, taking office January 1st of 2017. And then fortunately, my team and I were reelected um, again uh, this past year in 2020 in a crazy pandemic year um, to become uh, mayor again and uh, our full council slate. Great, and for those who don't know, uh, Mayor, uh, Newcomb Hospital was the hospital in Vineland. Uh, yes, it was, Sarah, uh, it was uh, Right, so uh, just to let people know, uh, I obviously dated myself and gave my birth date away, but uh, for those who <laughs> can calculate rather quickly. But um, uh, talk to us, Mayor, about uh, the fact that you really started in representative uh, government, if you will, with the school board, correct? Yes, um, <clears throat> you know, I'd always been very active in the community, um, you know, as a coach for some youth athletic teams, um, as a sponsor through my businesses, as a volunteer for different things. Um, so I've always been very community oriented. That being said, uh, some friends came to me uh, back in the beginning of um, 2006 and said, you know, you, you would probably be a great candidate because I was involved with, of course, the Republican Party. Um, back then, you know, essentially in door to door stuffing envelopes when we used to do stuffing of envelopes. Um, not we didn't have all the technology then um, that we do today. And, you know, and of course, you know, donations, raising money for the party and for candidates. And they said, why don't you get involved? And I said, well, you know, I'd love to be involved at some point. And some things were kicked around over the years, opportunities to run then now commissioner, but then freeholder, <laughs> possibly. And we always were set at home here in Vineland. And I said, you know, if there's something local, maybe. And came up, there was an opportunity that um, there were going to be uh, several seats on the Board of Education at Ripping Up. And um, we got together under uh, then Mayor Barcy and had some conversation with Perry about it. Um, I got to meet now, who's, you know, one of my best friends and like family, Paul Spinelli, who's been with me forever. Um, and um, I say he's kind of stuck with me. I'm, I'm probably his hemorrhoid. But um, we got on a board of education <laughs> together back in 2006. And uh, it was a, uh, an interesting ride. There were um, uh, four seats open at that time. There was one two-year term and three three-year terms um, that were up because someone had left the board previous. We had um, 19 people running for board of education seats then, which was an awful lot. 13 of them ran for the three-year seats that Paul and I were running for. Um, and uh, Paul was top vote getter. I was number two. Um, and then um, the third one was, um, I think, Myra Arroyo. Um, and, then I, and then the two-year seat was won by a guy, Chris Snyder. So back then, we had a pretty diverse board of education, but a great group of people that worked together. We didn't agree on every item, but I'll tell you, it was really a lesson in government. Um, and, uh, and it was an education in how things operated overall. I had never really dealt with um, unions to any degree at that point. 
So we had a lot of contract negotiations, a lot of things that were coming up and a lot to understand. And I was fortunate because I had Paul there because Paul, of course, was uh, a lifelong educator in the Atlantic City school system. Um, and he knew contract negotiations very well. So it was a lot of shock value for me. I'm like, well, why do we have to do that? He said, because it's contractual. Well, I learned those contracts real fast. And boy, you know, you just shake your head some days. I understand the need for the protections from political fallout, but sometimes it just, there was no rhyme or reason to things, just was in a contract and it was there for a very long time. So who knows what people did before you, but that's how it all started. And then, you know, I, I got involved because I wanted to really help the community. I wanted to help the students. I had a lot of friends that are staff members, people that I'm very close to, um, including my wife, who's a teacher. Um, and um, it gave me a, an education part in the pun on just how things were, but it was the right place for me to start. Um, I enjoyed my time on the Board of Education and, um, and I enjoyed our team, but I really enjoyed impacting students um, and really helping staff. Paul and I had goals back then, you know, we wanted to make fair compensation for staff members. We wanted to make sure they had the right working environments. We wanted to make sure the students had everything they needed. Um, and we had to address that. And that included, you know, kids from the high school down to uh, pre-K and, in, you know, and everywhere in between, as well as children with special needs, um, you know, and, and different handicaps. So, I, and we did a great job. You know, I was proud to, to be there and proud that my roots started then. Right. And obviously the uh, experience on the school board helped prepare you uh, one day to be the mayor. And now I think, uh, mayor, that uh, there's a lot of emphasis on people, good people, uh, wanting to uh, run for school board positions, uh, especially in lieu of the critical race theory that, uh, that now is being exposed throughout the nation, which we're happy to be part of those educating those uh, our citizens on critical race theory and the work that James Lindsay has did, our friend here at New Jersey Constitution Republicans, who's taken a, a national uh, uh, position on this and has been well exposed. But uh, it's very important for people to to run, to go for, out for school board positions, to get on these school boards so that they can uh, properly represent the uh, the, the uh, children and the those being educated as well as what the parents want because we've said all along, Mayor, that the parents are the chief educators. It starts from day one and it lasts a whole lifetime that the parents are the initial educators and that has to be restored. Um, they go to get the supplemental education that will help them live their lives as they go to uh, the elementary schools and high school and then eventually to college. But uh, the parents need to be involved and the best way they can be involved is to get on the school board. So Amen. it's obviously very, very important. Um, let's talk about the great diversity that makes up Vineland. People don't understand, uh, for one thing, that Vineland overall area is the largest uh, city in New Jersey, encompassing almost approximately 70 miles in area, um, square miles. And you really have a, you have a suburban area, you have an inner city area, you have an intermediary area. And so running Vineland is very much like running a little state, isn't it? Yes, it's correct. You know, we, um, we are huge. Um, it's, you know, we tout how big we are, but boy, it's a challenge. Um, managing such a large city um, is tremendous. Um, and it is a huge undertaking, but we are very diverse in population, um, mm -hmm. which frankly, our diversity is part of our major strength here. Um, you know, we have every kind of culture you can imagine, you know, yes, you have Italians, you have Germans, you have Asians, you have Ukrainians and Russians, you have uh, Hispanics, you have African Americans, you have Jamaicans, you, we've got it all here, you know, we're like that big melting pot. Uh, and frankly, yeah. if you're a food person, uh, you want to come here because we probably have every type of food you can imagine. Um, vegan, Middle Eastern, <laughs> I mean, you just name it goes right on down the line. And so many great places. Right. Um, and I am a foodie. So um, it's a good thing for me, but <laughs> yes, we, uh, we have a very diverse population. We are a very large city. Uh, we have a lot of needs, um, and a lot of care and, and we have a lot of challenges in our government. You know, we are a very strong city, um, in a very unique County that needs help. Um, you know, cause Cumberland of course is a very depressed County. It's 21 out of 21 in pretty much every category. You know, we're very proud to say that Vineland isn't, um, in last place at anything. Um, and we are, we are, you know, kind of the support system for the county. 
and we're hopeful that our our brother and sister cities can you know kind of get more on their feet soon and get some help if they need it and you know catch a break here mm -hmm. and there to be able to help carry that load because it is a tremendous drain on vinyl um we are um about 47 almost 48 percent of the uh, tax roll for the county we push out almost 48 million dollars a year to cumberland county for its operations so you know for for folks that are looking at it and you you take a dollar bill and you break it down into sections uh there are five components to our tax bill there's the county rate there's the library rate there's the open space rate right mm -hmm. um there is our rate and then there's a school district rate so we're running vineland on probably maybe 39 29 cent 30 to 29 cents on a dollar so every dollar that mm -hmm. comes in people sometimes think oh you're getting all these tax dollars they don't realize how much gets delved out you know you're right you're taking in giving about 26 27 million to the school district library gets their you know 1.4 1.5 mil open space gets a little piece but the county gets for almost 48 million dollars from us so mm -hmm. we have a a large territory the largest in the state to operate with the least amount and frankly, we don't get a whole lot of love out of Trenton. Um, you know, when it comes time to distribute uh, monies, you see where the monies are going. You know, um, you know, our biggest thing here is, as you mentioned earlier, I get along with pretty much everybody. And, you know, we work well across the aisle. The problem is sometimes uh, on the other side of the aisle, when you have leadership positions, they're too busy pandering to their base as opposed to doing what's right for the general good. Um, and we get hurt. You know, there was a lot of COVID money distributed. I saw an article last night. Trenton got some upwards of 72 or $73 million, right, mm. for Trenton. Now, you yeah. can see how significantly much larger Violent is than Trenton. We got $11 million yeah. over two years. And we couldn't use any of that money to offset property taxes. We weren't allowed. Mm. We put some things into our budget to do that, and they, the state took it out. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I hate to make this about the governor right now, but... You know, unfortunately, I think we're lacking we'll, in real leadership there right now. And we'll we will definitely discuss that, uh, Mayor. But uh, <laughs> what I want to uh, what I want to accentuate with the audience is how well you've been able to, um, in this age politically of polarization, um, where Democrats and Republicans are locked into trench warfare. Really, it's very similar to World War One, if you will, and. Uh, you have been able to break that with uh, an outstanding relationship you've cultivated with your city council, which again is indicative of the diversity of the city of Vineland. And you've been able to get uh, get work done, get what needs to be done um, in every area uh, that you discussed is how that dollar is chopped up into five pieces, but you've really been able to get the most out of it. And it's because of this relationship that you've cultivated with your city council. What has been the uh, secret to that success that other Republican mayors and representatives can uh, can add to their portfolio? That's a great question. You know, it's like the secret sauce, right? Um, for me, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just honestly, it's it's being upfront, it's being you know transparent, it's integrity, it's I. I attribute everything in life that I've been successful at in cultivating a good, solid relationship somewhere. I mean, I'm very fortunate. Like I said earlier, I have Paul with me, who's been with me for so long. Um, and above all else, you know, we're like family. Um, you know, we have Ron mm -hmm. Franceschini, who served on the Board of Education with Paul and I. David Acosta, who is our council vice president, um, is a tremendous person and has um, a long relationship through officiating basketball with Paul. Um, and it's how I came to know David as well. Uh, him and my uncle mm -hmm. were friendly, um, but myself being a bit younger than Dave, I didn't always see him. But when I uh, got into basketball officiating for a short period of time, I got close with David and we became very friendly. And he served on the board of ed just prior to me. Um, mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> but again, you know, had great relationships with Paul, very long standing. And uh, Paul's here with me today. And I would suspect that him and David probably go back over 30 years. 40 he mm. said okay so over 40 um and you know that's great and al vargas and i have known each other for a tremendous number of years when he was a full-time police officer here in the city of island we don't hold mm -hmm. against him that he's a mets fan um but we, we throw that out <laughs> once in a while um and um and of course dr arthur who i've gotten to know recently um who some of the members of our council have known her 
uh, extensively over the years. And she also served on the board of ed. Um, the only person actually on my, on my team here that was never a board of education member is Al Vargas. Um, so uh -huh. every one of them had a start in government somewhere. And, um, and I work with my team. I'm accessible, um, whether it's by phone or, you know, face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, you know, we're here, we communicate on a regular basis. And everybody talks about, you know, it, what a tremendous team we have. But you know what? We needed like-minded people. And it wasn't necessarily that they had a, you know, you know, it's whatever, you know, the mayor says, whatever Anthony has to say, it, to some degree it is, but we have to work together because the legislative body um, helps me impart our vision and frankly adds to our vision. But if you can't communicate with your people and you can't be upfront and honest, and if you're hiding things, it doesn't work. Um, you know, and frankly, we're a bipartisan team. You know, I have three Democrats on that council, you know, and then myself and Paul and one other Republican on our ticket, you know. So we, mm -hmm. we, we look at things from a global perspective and we're honest about it. And frankly, when you really break it down, if you're on team Vineland and that's what really matters for us here, our mm -hmm. visions are probably aligned. If you're not on team Vineland, you've got some other vision, some other perspective. Um, and that's why you wouldn't get along. And, uh, and this is what works here because we put partisan politics aside. We don't listen to the party line. You know, we do what's the best for the city of Island, which is what we took an oath to do, to serve and protect here. Frankly, my core Republican values make me strong on, you know, fiscal issues. They make me strong on public mm -hmm. safety issues, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and that's important with quality of life. And frankly, you know what, sometimes I ride the middle of the road because I have a bleeding heart for people. Um, so, you know what, if somebody said, oh, there's a liberal side to you, well, they're probably right because I care about people. I believe in helping hands. I don't believe in entitlements. And that's a big mm -hmm. thing too, where the country goes wrong. That's right. Of course, Lincoln talked about uh, helping people who cannot help themselves. And that's uh, essentially the attitude that you've had uh, since you've been mayor. And that's been indicative of the work that's been done. And uh, I also think it's interesting that you've been successful in working uh, with the Democrats uh, on the city council and getting the work done, mm -hmm. which is in direct opposition to what Phil Murphy has done. Of course, that polarization exists uh, in the state government. Yeah. Uh, just uh, essentially suspending these constitutional rights of freedom of assembly and religious expression and also the rights and privileges of Article One of our New Jersey Constitution for the people to be able to obtain, um, possess, and uh, secure their property, which was all uh, suspended during the COVID-19 uh, dilemma. But yet uh, you were able to successfully navigate uh, those waters. And how did you do that? How were you able to be successful in navigating these suspensions of uh, uh, constitutional rights, whether federal or state, and also uh, protect the, the community. How are you able to balance that and do it so, so, so successfully? It was a challenge. Uh, I, I really have to admit that we had to think things through. But you know what, we use good common sense in government here, you know, and what made the most sense and what was the best for our people is what we did. That's how we kept violence safe. Mm -hmm. We communicated with the public. We didn't disobey orders and things of that nature, but we really took things into consideration on how we enforced it. You know, there were a lot of people that I heard mm -hmm. the stories about. Um, there's no reason for that. And frankly, you know, it's ridiculous. You're fighting a pandemic. Vaccinations. There are a lot of people that have been in the lockdowns and masks, and this brought out a lot of topics. Um, for me, I think the most important part of this was sure whatever we did, it was done uh, with good consequence and the best interest of the people at all times. So that needed to be a real challenge for us to. Uh, Okay, we appear to be having a little bit of technical difficulty um, with our feed uh, with the mayor. Uh, and we actually uh, have lost him for a moment. Um, if the mayor can hear me, uh, try to uh, get back online with us if you can. 
And uh, we're having an excellent discussion here, a conversation with uh, Mayor Anthony Finucci of uh, Vineland, New Jersey, um, Republican mayor uh, who's done an outstanding job in his tenure um, beginning in 2016 uh, in Vineland. And we were discussing uh, his ability to uh, reach across the aisle and work with those uh, on the city council um, to get the job done in Vineland. And uh, of course, uh, Vineland uh, very much has its uh, fiscal house in order under uh, the mayor's uh, under the mayor's leadership. And uh, this is a um, he's really providing a template for uh, Republican mayors throughout the uh, state in uh, being able to uh, incorporate initial Republican principles that uh, we're going to begin to discuss, of course, which have to do with uh, uh, the really the outline of the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, which talks about the laws of nature and nature's God, which would be um, in relation to uh, law and order. And then of course, the um, equality, the self-evident truth that all men are indeed created equal and laws should be applied uh, equally um, to all human beings. And that um, the natural rights uh, that are got given by God rather than government, the unalienable natural rights, which among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, then also the consent of the governed as well. And uh, those who uh, are being governed uh, consent to be governed as long as the government is protecting their natural rights, which begin with life, uh, their liberty, uh, and uh, their ability to pursue their own happiness. Um, so um, this is what's so important for people to understand. And this is why we talk a lot about civics is uh, that the people um, need to understand what their rights are, which is what civic ed education will provide them. Don't, and then also how to be a good citizen within a civil society. So it's about knowing your rights and then being a good citizen uh, within your community. And uh, this is what the founders intended. This is what uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, essentially restored in identifying these principles directly from the Declaration of Independence. That is the Republican Party's platform and uh, it needs to be restored. And uh, we believe that uh, we're making progress in doing that. And uh, a lot of the work that uh, Mayor Anthony Finucci uh, is doing in Vineland is indicative of these same principles um, that uh, we derive directly from the Declaration of Independence. So we hope uh, that we can get uh, the uh, mayor back on here. We've had some uh, technical difficulties this morning, um, but uh, we hope you uh, are enjoying the show and that you'll share the show. We've gotten a lot of good information um, and a great conversation started with the mayor. And um, we do hope that um, we can um, uh, bring him back on here um, as soon as he can uh, uh, get into the waiting room. I'll be able to admit him uh, in and hopefully we can uh, again uh, get started with our New Jersey Constitutional Republicans virtual conversation that we're having with uh, Vineland Mayor Anthony Finucci. Um, and of course, we were talking about how big Vineland is uh, in area, in square area. It's approximately just under 70 miles. That's, you can imagine uh, making a trip up to Philadelphia and back uh, almost and uh, from, uh, from, uh, from almost from Vineland. And that's how uh, the large area of Vineland uh, encompasses. So there's a tremendous uh, amount of suburban area. There's a tremendous agricultural um, uh, aspect to Cumberland County, to Vineland uh, specifically with uh, uh, going out to East Vineland. And it's interesting to note that uh, Charles Landis was the founder of Hamilton, New Jersey, um, I believe in 1858. And then he uh, established Vineland, New Jersey. Um, a few years later, actually in 1861, at the beginning of the Civil War, and uh, he named it Vineland because of the uh, good soil that was there and the ability to uh, grow, grow grapes. And of course, we do have vineyards that have popped up through uh, uh, the Vineland area over the last few years, and uh, that is one of the um, attributes, agricultural attributes of our 
uh, of this of the municipality of Vineland. And here we have the mayor back. Wow, I don't Thank know what you. the world happened there, Jr. And I got you. Though. I'm sorry. That's that's not your fault. That's all. That all has to do with technology. <laughs> Information <laughs> technology is not a perfect science, even though we may think it is. No, we're trying. There are a lot of glitches that can go wrong. That's why we have cyber attacks and all other sorts of bugs and you're not um, kidding instances where we have trouble with technology. But great to have you back. Thank you. Um, I was just discussing uh, while we were waiting, uh, Charles Landis uh, founding Hamilton in 1858, then finding, uh, establishing Vineland, the first year of the Civil War, 1861. And Charles Landis named Vineland because of the rich agricultural soil, uh, the ability to grow grapes. We've had a couple of vineyards that have uh, been established over the last few years and restoring uh, the, the uh, winery business, which is uh so important and talk to us uh, mayor about the agricultural aspects east vineland has of course been known for uh, agricultural um, businesses and the economy for many many years uh, what in your estimation is the state of the agricultural business within vineland and what can we do what can be done to help uh, those who are making a living uh, by farming yeah i mean first of all great questions and and one of the greatest parts of Vineland is our agricultural community. Um, you know, right. there are farms in um, East Vineland, South Vineland, and North Vineland. Um, and they, um, frankly, are probably the heart and soul of the city in many respects. Um, you know, <laughs> they're doing good this year, thank God. Um, mm -hmm. The problem is, you know, is that everything is so much more inflated cost-wise. Um, yes. you know, because of what we're dealing with, again, I hate to say this with poor government decisions um, and allowing price gouging to go on um, when they say they're they're not allowing it and there's the price gouging czar it's a joke um, right but we all know what's happening but the farmers are having a good season so far um, I know for me I live in the eastern corridor of island and you know I can pretty much be within walking distance to any of the roadside produce stands um, the long hots are doing really well I can tell you I've been feeling them <laughs> lately, um, but they're doing great and tomatoes are coming out very soon. And um, it's great to see. I mean, they're they're booming. Um, the blueberry cultivation um, in Hamilton this year um, was a very quick season, it seemed like. Um, but the blueberries were incredible quality. Um, I was able to have um, plenty of my share of that already and, you know, and have a few more uh, coming. But we're very lucky and blessed here. Um, you can get anything you need in this city when it comes to produce. And, um, and frankly, it's, it's a great driver of, um, of the economy. The produce block here on Main Road is probably one of the busiest blocks in, in all of our area. Um, and they pump out a ton, a ton of food over there. And, you know, the auction has you know, been successful here for an extremely long time, as have the other co-ops around. But yeah, I mean, we, we have a great agricultural community here. We have farmers that give back to the community. And frankly, it's why my administration has made it a focus to give back and work with the farmers wherever possible, you know, helping them in any way, shape or form with what they need. Um, but we, um, I can't say how blessed we are enough uh, with that because having an agricultural community um, really puts you on the map. We paid tribute to the agricultural community um, last year during COVID when we revamped the water tower at Oak Road and Main Road. And uh, mm -hmm. we made a deal with the Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary Fisher came down. Uh, we did a press conference here and an unveiling because we did the um, Jersey Fresh logo on the water tower. You know, we always put mm -hmm. something up there, something for veterans, something for the city. Well, that tower was right. so big and had two visual points of view. So we put the City of Island logo up on the one side facing Oak Road, and then the Main Road side facing the produce auction we put up the Jersey Fresh logo and it was beautiful. Um, and it was a great right. tribute. We had a great turnout for that, even during COVID. People to come out and get excited about something and honor our farmers for everything they do for us here. That's right. And you've continued to honor our veterans, which was something that uh, Charles Landis was very, actually very concerned with because at the start of the Civil War, uh, many were volunteering and he was concerned there wouldn't be enough workers to uh, work uh, the agricultural economy that uh, he had begun but uh, afterwards he uh, went national with advertising letting veterans know that this is a great place to live the climate is uh, warmer than in new england 
and uh, that v veterans would be taken very good care of. So if you've continued that heritage, which has lasted for over a hundred and approximately 50 years now, and uh, that's why another reason why you've been very successful in your recognition and respect for our veterans. Thank you. And, you know, I, I take the men and women that um, served in our armed forces um, as extended family. Um, you know, mm -hmm. no one knows what they've dealt with or what they've faced unless they've been in their shoes. And frankly, um, in honoring our veterans, um, to me, is a, a very rich tradition. I have family that have served in the military, um, both here and in Italy. Uh, and I'm very proud of all of them um, and grateful for their service. One of the things that we've done recently mm -hmm. with Director Alisea and our solicitor, Rick Tanetta, as we put together these banners, which you're seeing probably up on Landis Avenue now, which is part of our initiative to honor mm -hmm. the veterans. You know, we put all these banners yeah. and flags and all this nonsense up all the time. And we had a conversation how they saw something one day and what a great idea this would be. And I said, it's fantastic. We should run it up the Avenue. And we've done that. Um, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, I've, I purchased a banner for my father-in-law who served in the Marines as well um, recently, which just got put up. And we've got um, uh, probably close to 100 between the ones that are put up and the ones that are being made right now that'll be up for family members that lived here in Vineland that can be honored here yep. for their military service. You know, we've cleaned up Landis Park. Um, we're making some significant changes to the mother's garden there for the Gold Star mother, mothers and families. You know, we're trying mm -hmm. to increase our Memorial Day parades and, and our Veterans Day things and ceremonies because it's important. And listen, you know it as well as I do, JR. At the end of the day, we're only here because somebody made the ultimate sacrifice for us to be here right. and somebody protected That's our exactly freedom. Right. So you and I could have this show today, you know, where I could stand proudly with that flag behind me and what's on my shirt, you know, and serve in this capacity. And it's an honor for me to serve as mayor of this great city. And I can only do that because somebody put rules in place and they fought to keep those rules in place. You know, they st started that yeah. constitution. Um, Many people died over that document and still are. Mm. Um, and right. I think currently what's happening in this country is a damn disgrace. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, that is a living, breathing document. And, you know, you don't have to be a fundamentalist, but you have to be a practical person to understand what was meant to be, was meant to be. And honestly, mm -hmm. I fought for those freedoms. Right now, unfortunately, and, um, you know, we're, we're lost in, in the national light of things. And that's why, you know, we like to keep the political things local. I don't consider myself yep. a politician. I really consider myself an elected official because I don't want to yeah. play nonsensical politics or, or child games. Um, you right. know, if I want to play games, I'll play with my kids. You know, I want to make yeah. sure that we're doing things here to make sure that people have best quality of life they can have in Vineland than anywhere else in this state. Um, they can walk these streets safely and securely because we have police protection. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we want our farmers to be able to, you know, get their product across and not be fear of being hijacked or stolen or vandalized. Right. You know, we right. don't want those crazy ways of life. We want quality of life here. and We want good quality of life. And frankly, if mm -hmm. people aren't interested in that here, they should move somewhere else because we want to keep all walks of life happy and safe here. You should be able to go to any church you want freely and without reservation mm -hmm. you should be able to worship on monday through sunday you know there mm -hmm. should never be an issue with that um which we saw during the pandemic too and that's why we worked with our churches to help them get outside and use our parks and you know allow them to do things you know that they wanted to you know if you want to separate church and state well i got news for you not in violent we're a religious community and frankly uh -huh. one of our big things is, is that i tell people you know they talk about, oh, you got to have faith in the community. My idea is to keep the community in the faith, right? Have Amen. the faith, right? You know, we've got a creator and a protector over and above us all else that we all honor. No matter what religion it is that they believe, there is that higher power. And I respect all their beliefs, even though I'm Roman Catholic. But, you know, it was frustrating when I couldn't take my kids to Sunday mass or Saturday night mass, yeah. you know, during that yeah. time. But, you know, we get back yeah. to just how we balance good government. I mean, you know, we're there. And I believe that I don't care if you're a Democrat, an independent or a Republican, you've got the right to live and breathe in peace and quiet and comfort and security. You have a right to worship. And, and that's important. People, people for, have forgotten that during all this here. And, 
it's a shame. We've seen a nasty side of some people and then it's brought out the best in others. So I don't know. I think we can keep working together though to figure it all out. Well, you're certainly doing a fine job in doing that, Mayor. I want to discuss with you, uh, now through history, um, the Vineland was a tremendous uh, creator, if you will, of the egg industry. Uh, Tremendous amount of uh, egg hatcheries uh, throughout the city. And then uh, we went to, Vineland went towards more of the uh, glass industry, which was a very predominant uh, in the, uh, after the depression, uh, not only with Vineland, but of course with Bridgeton, Owens, Illinois, and of course uh, Millville um, with Durant. So the, the glass industry was really remarkable, but yet the plastic industry really hurt that. Of course, the egg industry died out. And now we see that uh, demographically we have more service related uh, jobs. Um, and what you're trying to do is to uh, facilitate that, uh, to get people educated, to continue to f- fill these service-related jobs very much in the uh, medical field, as we see in Vineland, but also balancing the, uh, the manufacturing aspect of it. And you have a, f- a fine industrial park uh, in Vineland that has some very successful businesses. What are some of the challenges in continuing to grow the manufacturing um, aspect of what can be provided in Vineland, and you're up against uh, the you're up against a lot of foreign um, uh, the some of the deficits and the deficit um, trade uh, trade deficits and so forth um, that re- really could use um, maybe tariffs in some respects uh, to protect American manufacturing. But what are some of the challenges you have as mayor of uh, Vineland and bringing more businesses to the industrial park, which is right off 55, very accessible, logistically very, very well laid out. Uh, what are some of those challenges? Well, first of all, great question. And we, um, our biggest challenge now is land. Um, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. so proud of what my team and I have accomplished in the last roughly five years. It started mm-hmm. on the tail end of my, my council service um, as being council president. Um, and what I was cultivating for what I felt would be great if I were to have won that first election to become mayor. So we were putting plans in place early on to renew the city, because at that time, if you recall, under the two previous mayors to me, the city was really going down the drain. Um, We were Mm -hmm. losing jobs, businesses were running out of here. Um, They were being taxed unfairly. Um, Mm -hmm. They just weren't business friendly. And it was a, a stigma that Violin had. Um, my goal was to rebrand, remarket, let people know we are open for business. And, and that's mm-hmm. what we've done. And we took an initiative from the very beginning um, in January of 17. Um, and part of that initiative was to come up with a, re- a rebranding effort for the city of Island. Um, and mm-hmm. when I mean rebranding, I mean soup to nuts, brand new website, <laughs> brand new logo, slogan that made sense. Um, and a whole marketing initiative we've taken to, I'm sure you've seen the TV ads we've done over the years, the social media pages, the presence we have there, mm-hmm. um, the print ads. Yep. And if anybody goes to the Violent website and they start to look at that at violentcity.org, they could see all the mm-hmm. different press releases, all the different publications we've been in, the honors we've received, um, and what we've done really in the last five years. And it's it's been tremendous. So the challenges, of course, are trying to let people know we are a business-friendly environment, let them know why they should be here. Our best resources weren't even being marketed. You know, we have an electric utility Mm -hmm. that's here that has reliability second to none, right? Mm -hmm. We can generate the majority of our own power. We have allocations Mm -hmm. that are very environmentally sensitive and friendly with hydro, windmill, solar. Um, And of course, you know, we buy from our grid or we have our peaker units that we can run to generate probably about 85% Mm -hmm. of the city if we needed to right now. And, and it's important that people know that, plus the rate that you pay is significantly below the investor-owned utilities that are around us. So locating here, if you're a high electric user and you want to save off your bottom line right there, you're moving to Vineland. Mm-hmm. Our municipal Great tax point. rate is the lowest of all the big cities here in the county. So there's nobody yes, lower in municipal taxes than us. So we're proud of that. Right. Our water rate mm-hmm. is lower. Sometimes they argue connection fees and things of that nature because there's an infrastructure cost. But once you connect, you amortize that out, it's a cost you're doing business. When you start paying your water bill, we're we're probably 50% or more below the investor-owned water utilities. 
and our water quality is way better. Mm -hmm. So when you just look mm -hmm. at that, then we have the sewage authority that's here and then handles a large area of the city, especially all the industrial areas. So you're, you, you have right. wastewater that's going out into an authority that is you know governmentally run here. So you don't have to worry about that. And you have natural gas here and you have cable here and you've got everything under the sun and highway mm -hmm. access, like you're saying. Yep. So the real challenge was remarketing the city and rebranding it, which we've done a phenomenal job. Mm -hmm. And I'm so proud of our people um, because they took my vision Good question. And, and, and it was a little crazy. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that it wasn't because I was very aggressive in what I wanted to do in a short amount of time and we attacked it, but I'm relentless and my people know that and they know I'm going to stay on them, but they took that to task and they said, you know what, mayor, we've got you. And I said, all mm -hmm. right. And now we're in the process of our smart city concept. We've rekindled that. Um, uh -huh. And that's been a challenge because internet reliability, as we just saw a few minutes ago, isn't always great. We're right. working on creating our own system here. We have an RFI mm -hmm. out, an RFP for consultants on that because we want to be able to have our own internet and possibly if it works the way we want it to work and depending on how we can work with the FCC as well and the government, provide internet service as its own utility here to be faster, more cost effective and more reliable than you know the big yeah. monsters that are here now. Um, and I'll leave them nameless because we know who they are. But that's our goal. <laughs> we want to become more self-sufficient in that respect and it's important. The other challenge was is operating the city and operating the utilities like a business. You know, I brought in a director for the utilities from the outside, John Lilly, who is an absolutely phenomenal person, is a very long time friend and someone I have a tremendous amount of respect for because he came from the business world. Mm -hmm. He brought that business acumen in here. He brought the no nonsense attitude in here and the financial perspective to say, you know what, Mayor, I know what you want to do and I'm going to take care of it. And I'll tell you, I it's. You can go to sleep and night, put your head on a pillow and know that my utility is not just run, but as John would say, is managed. And he, he is an mm -hmm. active manager and has done a great job. So one of the hurdles we had there is everybody always thought, oh, you know, the City of Island Electric Utility, this is the golden goose they used to call it, right? Nobody mm -hmm. really realized until you got on the inside what was really happening financially in that utility. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't great. It was being run because it was right. a mandatory service and people had to pay their bill. So you're taking in a lot of money during the year, wasn't being managed properly, the finances yep. weren't done properly, the bonds they had that were outstanding weren't, in my opinion, done properly, they were missing the boat over the years. And when I was a councilman, I could not convince the then mayor to understand some of the issues we had. But then when I took the job here, we mm -hmm. knew what happened, I put him in, he dove right into this. And that utility has become so financially healthy, um, it, it makes you really proud, because it was having some issues and there were some right. challenges there. But that is the rock and the yeah. cornerstone of what we do here um, in the city of Island. And, right. and people should not make any bones about that. And the water utility that was was treated like a um, like an outcast for years has now been mm -hmm. really taken on, taken, gotten love, gotten paid attention to, gotten serviced. You know, mm -hmm. our goal was I don't want to become the next Flint, Michigan. Right. And coming back full circle to your question in regards to hurdles. They were big hurdles for us in the beginning to attract these businesses here, because if you didn't have quality, reliable utilities, you didn't have good infrastructure. Nobody wants to be here, you know, and that's the problem. Right. The roads were left in complete disrepair. You know, that has been yeah. a mission uh, for us to get these roadways done. Um, you know, and frankly, I, I can show you this. You can't really read it, but, you know, a long range road plan here, right? Uh -huh. You know, every year I've been yeah. in office, we have it. So 21 is here in yellow, 22 is in blue, and then this kind of peach color is 23 on already right. was programmed and planned here in the city of Vineland, right? Yep. You know, and it's only funny I have these things sitting on my desk because I'm always working. You know, this year I'm assembling parcels of land for a warehouse project here, right? We're looking at things here. I'm using my background in finance and real estate to say, let's assemble pieces of land nobody else wants. We could put this together. When this is done, it'll be close to 820,000 square feet of approved buildable warehouse space. The city will own and be able to sell to a developer to become a tax rateable, add jobs and add more manufacturing and warehousing into this city, which is what we need. And, and this is what's big for us. Because they didn't have it. They didn't look at this kind of stuff. You know, people get in these positions and I'm sorry, I'm on my soapbox now, but they get in these positions no, and it's about ego. Go, go. It's, you know, a, a thirst for power. Right. Nonsense. It's not what it's right. about. It's about serving the community, serving the people you care about mm -hmm. the most. And frankly, 
I want my kids to have a reason to grow up here, stay here. If they go off to college, come back here and have a job to come to. When I took over, our unemployment rate was abysmal. It was terrible. And, right. and, and they were coasting on this thing. And I got a guy running for re-election with the worst unemployment record in the city's history. I'm mm -hmm. running against him saying, you can't be proud of this. Are, are, you, are you naive right. to it? Do you not understand it? They thought they did a great job. Right. Well, we come in, our unemployment rate becomes the lowest in city history after a few years of working hard. And even mm -hmm. during COVID, we still had a, a low rate because a lot of our things were essential businesses here, food processors, which is important, mm -hmm. cold storage, which is important to right. keep these things going, Right. moving the manufacturing out. And you're right, starting out in the glass industry, you know, Corning is over here getting a contract mm -hmm. to make the vials for the vaccines. It's localized, it's important. Mm -hmm. They get a huge federal contract and they're right here in our backyard, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. So now we gotta make sure we're reliable for them with water, electric, sewer, everything that's necessary, right. but all those people are still working. And frankly, before COVID hit, we had a surplus of jobs. If you weren't working in the city of Vineland at that time, you either had, unfortunately, a, a medical condition or, or a physical reason you couldn't, mm -hmm. or probably you didn't want to. Because when we right. came in, there were no jobs. When we got it, our, our progress started here and we moved forward, we had over a thousand surplus jobs in Vineland because we brought manufacturers back because we helped out the essential people, because we marketed all over the country and brought companies in from the Midwest, which never would have been here and known about us had we not marketed the way we marketed. And that's right. why I say I have tremendous pride in my team. You know, yeah. I can impart a lot of things, but I can't do everything. So I was smart enough to get some really great people around me. You know, our legal staff right. is second to none. My business administrator is top notch. Um, you know, my counsel works hand in hand with me on just about everything you know we were yeah. revamping our technology here our utilities my directors i mean there's so many people i have to thank because i can sit here as the figurehead and listen you know how it is when you're the bad one it's off with your head when you're the good one you get all the yeah. accolades but i have to spread the accolades around to my team because um because of them right. I am who i am my assistants here you know if, if i didn't have my staff here in my office i don't know what i would do some days because i get so busy i couldn't even tell you where a pen is and, and poor Alona right. has to go run around <laughs> and find me stuff on a regular. <laughs> and I have to thank my staff and my businesses because I'm extremely active in those businesses every day, but they help carry an extra bit of a load because they know what I'm doing here. And my personal staff has bought into my mission and making Violent a better place for them and their families, which hopefully will spread through Cumberland County and help Cumberland move forward as well. Right. And then another thing I want the uh, I'd like the audience to understand too, uh, Mayor, is that we were talking about infrastructure. You know, infrastructure eventually wears down. We have what we know as the second law of thermodynamics, which means everything is breaking down breaking constantly. Down. <laughs> and we knew I thought it was very interesting in the beginning of the show. You talk about how that dollar is chopped up in five ways, and I didn't hear anything about infrastructure improvement. So another tremendous challenge. Uh, for you and the uh, council is to try to uh, garner the uh, funds to be able to replace sewage lines and to be able to replace uh, water lines and some of the grid components to uh, Vineland Electric and on and on it goes. It's a tremendous challenge. So just touch on that uh, for a moment, if you would. Absolutely. And boy, I'll tell you, you're singing, you're singing my song today, JR, because... <laughs> <laughs> what do you need? You need a good foundation to let it all build, right? And your infrastructure is your foundation. That's right. We just finished that Landis okay. Avenue uh, phase project down from Main Road to Myrtle. And there's some things that still have to be corrected there in the westbound lane. They're working on the contractors. But when we went in there, my goal like there, like Becker Drive and Palermo Avenue and East Avenue, so many others were working on and have been working on, mm -hmm. was to get underground and assess what's under there. So many times right. a road gets paved doesn't matter what city you're in and they just pave the road well mm -hmm. I, I tell people find out how long the water taps have been there the water mains have been there the valves have been there talk to the lsa the sewage authority and ask them how old is their infrastructure underground by the way call verizon call comcast how old is your infrastructure south jersey gas what are you doing so our engineering department mm -hmm. has gotten into this groove now thankfully mm -hmm. under our our tutelage to them to say if we're going to fix it let's fix it all and fix it right once now when you right. go down there they won't need to fix sewer water gas 
or any of the other cable or, or Verizon services underground there, probably I'm going to guess for another 50 years or more, unless there's a random break of something, which does happen mm -hmm. because we went under there and a the project took longer than expected, but we knew it had to get addressed. So yeah. every single utility that could be underground and it's latent, you can't say it until something is broken on the street and you know, if water's bubbling or there's a gas leak, you don't know. So let's avoid all that. Let's not rip our beautiful brand new million dollar road up and have somebody come in later, yeah. get it done now. Common sense. Right. And that's what we did. And then we were able to do it because we budgeted. I want to put new curbing in. I want to put sidewalks in. I want to upgrade those things. I want them right for those families that can walk from main road all the way up now on a sidewalk safely and not have to fear walking on a high traffic land this Avenue. It just right. makes more sense. So for infrastructure, it's a very big part of what we do. But again, you know what? People talk infrastructure, but they don't always do it. And, and frankly, that is a big Republican thing because we always go after mm -hmm. infrastructure. You're hearing infrastructure packages now. You're hearing a lot of talk at the federal level. That's all it is, is talk. Right. This package is nonsense. Right. They're earmarking those bills with crap. Um, no and that's why they're so overbloated. So mm -hmm. I think that's where our fiscally conservative and more practical values come in and say, you know what, right. if we're making an infrastructure bill or we're making infrastructure improvements here, my money here in the city of Ireland that we delve out, which is our taxpayer money, is mm -hmm. earmarked directly for infrastructure and not something else. I'm not hiding mm -hmm. in a bond if I'm going for a bond to say, hey, listen, I want to put you know a couple million in roads here, but I want $3 million in nonsense. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. That is good conservative policy making there in our opinion. Uh, and I make it very clear with my council, I'm an extreme fiscal conservative. And honestly, yep. even, even the Democrats are on my council are very fiscally conservative, right? So they're, mm -hmm. they get it. And I say, no, we're earmarking for this. If there's something here that's a dollar coming in, albeit a tax or a bond or some level of revenue, we're earmarking it for mm -hmm. those things. Our budget has never been more transparent or more clear, um, probably since Mayor Barcy was, was mayor, because he was very particular in how they allocated their funds. Of course, he's a CPA, so he gets it. Uh, for right. me, again, finance and business background were very clear, but infrastructure is huge. Every single year, we are putting together a multi-million dollar plan for infrastructure improvements mm -hmm. in the city, as well as the utilities. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. Yeah. A lot of people say, oh, this road is, is, I get blamed for roads that are 40 years in disrepair. I'd laugh. I say, I haven't been mayor for 40 years yet. And mm -hmm. I don't think I want to go that far. <laughs> but as long yeah. as I'm here, we're going to get to that. Yeah. So yeah, JR, you're singing my song with infrastructure. I love it. Now let's touch on uh, a, the essential reason, or the essential purpose that the founders had for government was to protect the person and their property. And we see in the Declaration of Independence, the first statement of authority references the laws of nature and nature's God, law. And that is indicative of law and order. So what have been some of the challenges over the last year with the unwarranted and um, really the um, inaccurate um, accusations made against our law enforcement officials in doing the job that they are supposed to do? And almost as if it what the Democrats have done is turned it around to where the victims are the criminals and that the law enforcement people are the criminals, but yet violent, you've been able to successfully get through that uh, to uh, support law enforcement. How important is it for people to know that um, law enforcement is not systemically racist? What it may be is they may lack training. Uh, we see with some of the incidents that the training was really the reason uh, you can't go into the, we all know that people are born sinners, but it's the training that's the problem. It's not a systemic uh, racist problem, as many on the left accuse, it, accuse uh, law enforcement of doing. So what have you done to create a stability there and continue to support the law enforcement officers who deserve our reverence and great respect in maintaining uh, the protection of our lives and our property? Man, right on, brother, right? <laughs> so for me... Um, I've taken a very firm stand on this issue. And while they're defunding and they're ignoring and not wanting to do anything, these cities, and even frankly, I hate to say it, some of our Republican counterparts are in the same vein because they're, they're scared. Mm. I'm not scared of reelection. Yep. You don't want me back, then don't put me back. But when I'm here, you can right. be damn sure I'm going to do my job. You're defunding, I'm hiring. 
I'm hiring every single year to this force. We are filling vacancies. We are getting our men and women replaced through attrition for their retirements. I'm adding numbers to it. My goal is to have the highest numbers of police in the city, in city's history. We're right there and we're growing. Why? Because our city is growing. And frankly, at the end of the day, the same people that want to defund and are screaming and crying on television all the time, who are they calling when they have a problem? That's how I look at it. But one thing I have done here is, and I'm very fortunate, is we have an extremely diverse police force. We have Mm -hmm. men and women. We have all walks of life in there, all religious backgrounds Mm -hmm. in there. And it happens. And we're a civil service community, but we're able to go a long way in helping people. You know, we want to have a police force that is reflective of a community. And we do. We have African-American. We have Hispanic. We have Caucasian. We have some Middle Eastern. We have some Asian. We have everything around here. And that's important for everyone to know, you know. And when there's an issue, I don't run from my cops. I'm not looking for cover. I'm looking to stand as a leader. You know, I don't know if you could say it right, Mm -hmm. but our our slogan last time was proven leadership, right, for our team. And that's something I stand by. In times of crisis, people want a leader. And if you're running scared and there's an issue, you don't belong in leadership positions. When a George Floyd incident happened and it, it, you know, it was like a nuclear bomb went off across this country. And frankly, people can debate the good, the bad, or the indifferent. Irregardless of the individual, a loss of life is sad. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to pick one side or the other on that because a, I'm not that cop that went through that. I'm not Mr. Floyd who passed away. Um, and I didn't witness it. I Mm -hmm. saw it on television, but I discount half of it. Um, the sad thing is loss of life is tragic, but you're right. Training is an issue, (laughs) but for us, we always keep up on our training here. Um, I provide a diversity training for all the employees in city hall, um, each year as well, as well as sensitivity training when we came into office. So we're getting ready for that expiration. Mm-hmm. And then another cycle of that will happen to renew that training moving forward next year. Um, once we're completely right. this COVID mess, which will help keep people informed. But when that issue happened and you had all the, all the people on both sides <laughs> posturing on who was right and who was wrong, I felt it was necessary to right. stand more with my officers and more with this community as the leader than more than ever. We had a march here in the city of Island for that, right? We didn't have an issue during that march. I walked in that march with members of our community from all walks of life, including some of my closest friends, which are African-American. We met here at City Hall and I said, we will have a peaceful march. We will not have violence in this city. Mm -hmm. Our businesses, our families, our residents, our visitors will not be disrespected or uprooted in any way, shape or form here. And our community leaders stepped up with me especially those from the NAACP Mm -hmm. and many from out of town that came in to assist to say, Mayor, we respect you. Mm -hmm. We care for you. This will not be an issue here. We will police our own. And as I sit here, I can remember it like it was yesterday. Some of the members Mm -hmm. of the NAACP said, if you, and I quote, act a fool, you will be removed. And don't worry about the Mm -hmm. violent PD doing it. Because they knew Mm -hmm. this was about getting a message across that there had to be an eye-opening and awakening of what happened here to maybe advent more training, more cultural diversity, yep. people to understand things. Because you have a lot out there. You have emotionally disturbed people, people that have are sensitive yep. to an issue, people that have a mental challenge or handicap. You, these officers yep. don't know what they're going into most of the time. So this has prepared That's us right. to have more technology, more preparations in the department for people to register those at those addresses that may have emotional issues or may have a problem. So the officer, when this comes up on their screen, knows what they're walking into in some cases. So if anything good came mm-hmm. out of this, it has been the additions of making people aware. And that's what we're very proud mm-hmm. of. But we didn't have that issue. We had thousands of people march up Landis Avenue. And frankly, Jody Farbell, the Millville Police Chief, walked with us. I had Mayor Bridgeton walking with us. We had our folks from the NAACP walking with us. My police chief walked with us. My captains, our lieutenants. And we had our officers around mm-hmm. in our security here. Um, and then they had their rally, which they had up at the old Sears building, um, which I know the, the county mm-hmm. prosecutor was involved in. Um, but we walked together as a community to unite, not in violence, but an appreciation and respect for each other to know that someone had an issue from some other walk of life. And we wanted to make sure that people were there. Now you have the screamers and yellers and 
all the people that want the nonsense right. that, you know, want to be heard or, or, or want the spotlight on them for 10 or 15 minutes. That's not what we're about. Mm -hmm. We're about healing right. our community. We're about staying stronger together. And that's what we do best. And frankly, that needed me to be front and center and not just front and center to be there as a pawn, but to be there as front and center, not to take any BS from anybody, but to let them know we right. will stand together for what is right all the time. And I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. What is right is right. Yep. And that was it. So hand to God, that's how we handle these things. And we will keep hiring police. Outstanding leadership, Mayor. Thank you. And we're budgeting for more for the next class. So we're going to keep it up, but we're going to make sure our police know all the time. If they make a mistake, we need to be there for them to understand it because mistakes do happen. When you do something intentionally to hurt someone for the wrong reason, that won't be tolerated. So, and they know that too, but my men and women here, I, I would stand neck toe to toe with them any day because they are really truly about our community. Well, and they obviously believe that uh, mayor because uh, you have garnered uh, public union support uh, over the years, which is uh, very unique for re Republican representatives, but it's because you um, personify these initial principles that uh, that go beyond uh, groups or sectarian um, characteristics, but you're equally treating everyone the same, uh, equal application of the law the same, gets back to our Republican 14th Amendment. But uh, I think it's important that people to realize that you have the support of the public unions. I do. I'm very grateful for that. Um, but I've been always very honest with them. You know, when we do contract negotiations, I sit down with them at the table and I say, mm -hmm. you know what, let's talk, let's talk the issues, let's work through them, uh, go there. Before I took office, they had contracts that were expired for five and six years. It's not necessary. It's not. If you can't figure out finances, then you need to be honest. Maybe you could figure out contract language, right? Well, for us, we've right. been able to balance all of the above. But I've always been honest with them. I've never lied to them about money. I've never lied to them about language. Morning, Rick. I've never lied to them in any way, shape, or form about performance. We've always worked together as a team. Mm -hmm. And they understand that. And frankly, when they need the support, I'm there. But I'm fair. Negotiations are just that. Both sides give a little and take a little. You can't go in there, you know, with a hammer and this is it or it's no way. That works with no one in life, right? No matter where, what side of the aisle you're on. And honestly, and that's worked out. And frankly, that's why I have the support of the PBA, the FMBA, uh, the IBEW, mm -hmm. you know, backed us. Yeah. It's tremendous. Um, but again, I believe that there are times and places for everything. And frankly, you know, listen, in our world today, um, unions are a very huge factor of life um, when it comes to, you know, all levels of government. But if you work with them fairly and correctly and you work with the right contractors, and yes, you have to have a healthy balance. We balance small contracts with mom and pop shops and other people and their successful bidders. Mm -hmm. And there's a way they can do everything. But we're fair. We are fair. Everyone gets a fair shot here. The deck is never stacked against yeah. one person and for another because we don't believe in that. Right. I've always wanted a fair shot in life at doing things in business when I wanted to earn my way. Mm -hmm. And I expect that we give that to everybody else. And I think that more often than not, with our transparency, and I'm accessible. If the unions want to come in and talk about something, I'm here to talk about it. If someone from another party wants to come in and talk to me, I'm here. My door is open. Yep. I make appointments at all times of day and night and different, doesn't matter You know, if it's a weekend. I'm available for people and I tell them, call me. We can talk about anything you want to talk about. And I think that's how I've garnered a lot of democratic support over the years. Yes. It's funny because some people and think that's... I'm a Democrat. Um, and I get that. I'm like, listen, I'm a Republican. <laughs> I'm everybody's mayor. I'm the mayor of Ireland, right? And I said, I have my values. I have my beliefs. I have, I'm very strong in, in my principles, but I listen to people. You cannot mm -hmm. be in this position and not listen. Yep. Whether I want to hear what they have to say or not, they have a right to tell me. When you take, sign up for this job, it's not all peaches and cream, right? You, have the, you, you must listen to people. Yep. And that's been the downfall to other people in this position. They didn't want to hear it if it wasn't what their thought process was. Yep. They didn't want to be open to somebody else's discussion. Mm -hmm. And honestly, and that's part of the problem you know, uh, with, with government again, in general, they don't want to hear you if they don't align with you. So I think that's right. how we've been mostly successful. A couple of topics. Uh, right. A couple of topics I'd like to uh, discuss with you before we uh, sign off or coming close to uh, 
the end of the program. But the mayor, I wanted to uh, ask you how important it's been. And of course, you are a large part of the great Republican resurgence uh, that occurred uh, with the winning of our LD1 candidates of State Senator Michael Testa and our Assemblyman Anton McQuellen and also uh, Eric Kurtz Simonson and uh, the great Republican resurgence. How important has it been as mayor of Vineland to have those uh, fine representatives in Trenton um, helping our citizens out in LD1? So it's great, of course, you know, <clears throat> having the Senator in your backyard is really important um, for a variety of reasons. Um, Down the street. Yeah, I mean, whew, it's great. I mean, our offices are close to each other. Our houses are close to each yeah. other. Uh, but we, we have three fine gentlemen in those positions right now. And um, mm -hmm. I'm very proud to be serving with them. And they are working very hard for LD1. Um, and really, mm -hmm. not just for LD1, but their principles are being, um, if they implement more of them across the state, it'd be very helpful. Um, but it yes. means a lot. And yeah, and we were, of course, very um, instrumental in helping them get where they got. Um, it, it, it means a lot. We've got a lot of good candidates that run on all sides of the aisle sometimes. They're good people. But not everybody's cut out to serve. <laughs> Um, and frankly, in Trenton's a, um, you know, a tough arena to fight in, but they are fighting for us and are fighting for the greater good. And we're very appreciative of them. And I know they have an election this year, um, again, and as does everybody in the state, really, uh, that's on the legislative level, uh, along with the gov. Um, and, yeah. you know, they're, I think they're going to do, you know, well um, there and, and, you know, they're working hard. And, and honestly, we're there, you know, the anomaly is Congressman Van Drew. Um, because when Congressman Van Drew was then Senator and was a Democrat, the interesting thing was, is, and again, because of our working relationships, he was wonderful to the city of Vineland. Um, anytime you needed him, he was there. I, I, he never turned his back on us. It was never a partisan issue. And I think he got some flack mm -hmm. for that once in a while, uh, you know, because I am a Republican, because I know some of my elected friends that are Democrats and some of those people that are in you know, democratic leadership positions that I'm close with that we work together for the greater good and just put good government first, catch a lot of mm -hmm. crap and nonsense from their party um, for working with me. Mm -hmm. And it's a shame because they unfairly get treated for that, but it's how we get things done. But, you know, I'm anxious mm -hmm. to see the turnout in November, how things go. And um, mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll be keeping our, our, our membership there the way it is. And, and that'll be good for us here and continue for the community. Um, but it is good that, you know, that people are pretty much mostly aligned with your values that are in office, because then when you pick the phone up, it's easier like minded conversations. It's not that you have to sell yourself right. or convince yourself that someone or convince someone else about yourself. Um, so it's good. And, um, and that's why when Congressman Van Drew jumped over and became, you know, Republican congressman, um, I think he fit in pretty easy because he was a kind of a conservative guy to begin with on, on a number of issues, mm -hmm. not every issue, but a number of issues. So he's kind of very right. middle of the road aligned and, you know, worked out in our favor, I guess, to pick up the constitutional seat again over there as the Congressman. Um, right. Uh, it was something which was shocking um, during all that time. But we've had some turmoil in the last couple of years, haven't we, JR? <laughs> yes, we have, we have, we certainly have. And uh, as we wind down, Mayor, I wanna ask you, uh, you uh, came out and publicly endorsed our Republican gubernatorial candidate. The New Jersey Constitutional Republicans unprecedentedly um, endorsed uh, Mr. Jack Cetarelli, and uh, who uh, we have a tremendous relationship with. He's a great um, admirer and uh, advocate of the policies of Abraham Lincoln as his mentor. And of course, that's very important to reestablishing uh, his image as our leader of the Republican Party eternally. And uh, tell the viewers, uh, Mayor, why it is imperative. It's absolutely essential that we get out and vote in Jack Cetarelli for, as our next governor. Oh, boy. I mean, he is a class act. Um, and he has a lot of mm -hmm. respect for you. We've, we've had a number of conversations. And I know he appreciates um, all of your support and all of your follower support. Um, and, you know, again, Jack is just a quality human being father, yep. a husband, was a businessman, was an elected official. He gets it. He just gets it. And it is important and it is imperative that everyone gets out and votes. And we really need to vote for him. He is the representation we need at the gubernatorial level moving forward to get this state back up where it belongs. And Governor Murphy is a pleasant individual to talk to, but his policies are just not good for this state. 
frankly, mm -hmm. they're not good for any state, in my opinion, because they are taxes, right. taxes, taxes, right? It was um, unfortunately ruled by dictatorship in 2020 mm. in many respects. No question. Um, I was very unpleasantly surprised to see the bully tactics that came from his administration at a lot of levels and frankly disappointed. Um, mm -hmm. And again, there's a, there's a person that you respect because, you know, till this is over, he's the boss, right? And you work with everyone yeah. when you have to, even some days when it hurts. But I can mm -hmm. tell you folks, if you're out there and you're listening to JR and I today, I was on board with Jack Cittarelli from the very beginning. Um, and before mm -hmm. that announcement even came out, I know JR really got to know him and did his homework. Um, mm -hmm. I, I implore you to vote for him and I ensure mm -hmm. you that he is the guy we need um, running this yeah. state because he cares. And frankly, he cares about the entire state, which includes South Jersey in his eyes. We will not be ignored like we have been. And that's important right. for people to know. He was here last night. I actually, of, of all things, I took my family to dinner last night. And mm -hmm. as I'm walking out of Marigi Savoy Inn over there on the East Landis Avenue, sure. walk right in the jack, walking in the front door. Right? I said, what in the world uh -huh. are you doing down here? And I said, you didn't yeah. call me and tell me you were coming. I said, you could have had right. dinner. He said, actually, he said, I'm hot on the trail. I don't know. It yeah. must have been 15th or 16th stop for the day. He's down yeah. here, 730 at night, coming in to see a group of people having uh, their club dinner at the Savoy last night. I said, Jack, God bless you for you, your stamina, and your power to keep going. Yeah. And, you know, people are like, why is this guy coming down here to do this? Well, the whole point yeah. is he's working hard for everybody and he wants them to be recognized. And that's what I told the person that asked the question. It's like, I'm blown away. They said, this is the kind of guy you want. Not someone that's going to be here yeah. only when there's a hot topic or an issue. So right. Jack's our man. And uh, yep, that's why. And yeah. I don't come out and endorse a lot of people, you know. Um, I'm like you in your group. And I, when I heard you guys endorsed, I'm like, oh, praise God. And good for you. Yeah. And I'm proud of all your people for being behind you too. Because right. he's, he's our man. He is. And he's, and the other thing too, Mayor, uh, we actually, we uh, applied the great Beach Boys song, I Get Around uh, to Jack as his theme song, because this man has gone to every single Republican organization throughout the state, every single club uh, from the North, from Wayne, New Jersey, all the way down to Cape May. And he has really earned uh, this position. That's why we're so proud of him. He has, you know what, Jay? Yeah, go ahead. Before we even move on or, or, or sign off, we have to make sure that we get to all those other Republicans that may have supported another candidate and tell right. them, get on board on this train. Do not stay home yes. and not vote for him because there's going to be some people that are soured for one reason or another. Right. We cannot have four more years of what we've had. And believe no. you me, if you put our faith in what JNR are telling you today, we're telling you to vote for this guy. When, when he wins and he gets in, you will be happy you voted for him and you will be able to be proud to say, I voted for Chitterelli. And you know what? It's going to be right. important that you do that. Do not stay home, Republicans, independents, people that care or like-minded that are watching this program. Get up, get out and vote. Get it done, yes. please. It's important. That's right. Especially those independents and uh, rational thinking Democrats that may be out there too. That's Mayor, right. But uh, as, as we finish up, I want to thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I'll remember something that you said from the beginning when I asked about the secret, the secret, if you will, or the formula, uh, the recipe for your success. And you said it was interpersonal relationships and the mark of a true leader. And this goes back to Washington and Lincoln and all of the great men of our history. The mark of a true leader is someone who genuinely cares about those who they lead. And I know that you genuinely care about all those who you lead, whether they're Democrat or Republican. And that is what has made you so successful. And uh, I would want to say that you remind me and, and take into consideration these two modifiers, that you are very much a benevolent and virtuous uh, recreation of Mayor Frank Rizzo in my regard, in my thinking. And, I'll take uh, it. He did it, he, he was, a, he, and you, but you again, virtuous and uh, also very, very um, benevolent in what you do. But I really think that your leadership capabilities are attributable to that number one 
aspect and attribute of genuinely caring for those who you lead and congratulate you. you on that. Thank you, JR, very much. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. It's an honor to be on this show. Um, you know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you um, and for the Constitution and, and what people sacrificed to make that document happen. Um, and, I, and, you know, it's like, like I say, it's a living, breathing document, if people, if there ever was one. And I, and I applaud you for what you do and always reminding people of that and being the constitutionalist that you are and sticking firm um, to what you believe in. Uh, it, I couldn't be prouder to call you a friend. Well, I appreciate that. And the respect is uh, mutual. I have a tremendous amount of respect uh, for you and the great job. And I really believe that you are an example uh, to many Republicans and uh, rep representatives throughout not only New Jersey, but throughout the uh, nation, which uh, we do get some uh, looking at our virtual conversations throughout the country, thankfully. But I really want to appreciate you taking the time today. We'll have you back on for another Love update uh, in a few months. Uh, prior to the election. And uh, we really appreciate your time, uh, Mayor Finucci, and keep up the great work in uh, leading Vineland. You've really uh, got, got Vineland's house in order. And uh, you are you're to be congratulated on that. God bless you. God bless America, brother. That, amen. Thank you for joining me. And let's remember, uh, Mayor, that uh, what Lincoln said about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the Union, he said this, he said, quote, all this is not the result of an accident. It's not by luck that our nation's founding documents come about and the ideals in which they personify. All this is not the result of an accident. It has a philosophical cause, he said. Without the Constitution and the Union, we could not have attained the result. But even these are not the primary cause of our great prosperity. He said there's something back of these entwining itself more closely about the human heart. That something is the principle of liberty to all. The principle that clears the path of all, gives hope to all, and by consequence, enterprise and industry to all. And I know, uh, Mayor, that uh, that philosophy and those ideals uh, make up uh, the premise by which you govern the city of Island. For sure. Thank you all. Well, uh, please share this video and uh, like the video. Well, it'll be up on YouTube. We'll have it uh, also up on our New Jersey Constitution Republicans Facebook group page on our Republican Ac or Constitution Republican Academia page. So please like and share. Mayor Anthony Finucci, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, JR. Take care.